everyone to our seminar number 189 and again we return to the global research system and this time we'll be looking closely at Germany and very good to have Justin Powell with us to to help us along the way with that um I might before introducing Justin I'll just take you through the webinar protocols I'll change the order I do things in a little um now the webinar is being recorded so your wisdoms uh, in the chat and uh, and also on camera will um, be uh, on YouTube within 48 hours and uh, on our website and uh, including the chat function and do remember that it'll be recorded for all time and in you know five or ten million years when they're studying human culture from the planet Zog they'll be they'll be wondering why did you ask that question in the webinar um, the uh, best way to handle the webinars is to stay muted because then we don't pick up your background noise but um of course when you are coming into the q a do turn your microphone on at that point and same with the video you don't need to have the video on during the webinar but um please turn it on when you're asking your question if you can if your camera is working um we recommended that you use speaker view in the zoom settings so you can more clearly see who is talking now to ask a question, uh, and with, well, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions arising from Justin's presentation, use the chat function, put your question down there, and then we'll be able to select you into the Q&A session. And those who come forward in the first, you know, period of the Q&A, or even towards the end of Justin's uh, presentation are more likely to be picked up uh, as part of the Q&A session. So I do recommend coming forward early. We sometimes get very good questions in the last five minutes, 10 minutes that we can't deal with. When you're invited to ask a question, well, unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and then state your name and where you were from. Now, pleasure to introduce Justin J.W. Powell, um, one of the world experts on science and science systems. And um, Justin is the Professor of Sociology of Education at the Institute of Education and Society at the University of Luxembourg. And he's currently also a visiting research fellow in our Oxford Department of Education. And we, I'm sure, would have met long ago, Justin, in person, but the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown has cut across that possibility. So it's a real pleasure to, to see you for the first time uh, you know, on camera today. Justin's uh, comparative institutional analysis chart persistence and change in special and inclusive education, in vocational training and in higher education. And he's published author that we often cite in those areas. And he particularly focuses on science systems and research governance. His award-winning books include Comparing Special Education, Stanford UP 2011, Barriers to Inclusion, Routledge the same year in 2016 again, and the Century of Science, the Global Triumph of the Research University, Emerald 2017 and 19. So we look forward to your presentation now, Justin, and the screen is yours. Thank you, Simon. So yes, um, I guess I could have chosen a better time to go on sabbatical at Oxford, but uh, I did manage to have uh, some very nice walks in the park with Maya Cianciliani. And um, if we're looking for silver linings, then this uh, CGHE series is one of them because uh, it really provides a way to, to broaden the conversation and to, to be, get into dialogue with a lot more people than would be in a normal conference room. So today I wanna talk about universities and research institutes and their, uh, the way that they uh, power global mega science. Uh, these are Germany's dual pillars of science production. Let me set the stage uh, here, thinking about higher education and global mega science uh, by acknowledging that uh, many of us who work in higher education uh, um, often are aware that um, policymakers and stakeholders view higher education as a panacea, as a source of social integration, economic development, and scientific advance. Growing uh, global science capacity relies on this higher education expansion and investments in research. Uh, and in the book that David Baker and I are currently writing, Global Mega Science, uh, we speak of the university science model, and I'll go into that today. Most nations, 
even the smallest like Luxembourg and Qatar, have established research universities to educate professionals and to foster social and ec economic innovation. All contribute to scientific discovery. Science is a global collaborative effort, especially mega science projects. And indeed, we're living through um, the, this mega science project uh, over the last year in terms of vaccine development, which is showing us uh, how much capacity we have to solve uh, uh, problems and to work together um, to solve them. Some of the questions I want to pose today, and we've been working on in the last years as a, as a larger global research team, are, are there limits to growth in scientific production? Can we expect continued exponential growth in higher education and science? Um, how did university science evolve over the century of science? And today, particularly, what can we learn from Germany, one of the largest science producers, about science production in an era of collaboration? So thinking about global mega science and Germany and the context, so why look at Germany? Germany is a provider of models, not only in vocational training or in uh, uh, compulsory schooling, but also, of course, the research university originated there. Most successfully institutionalized, perhaps in the US, the university science model has been emulated globally. And the independent government-funded, highly prestigious research institute was also developed in Germany. Ironically, this dual pillar model and research policy emphasizing scientific genius is now out of sync in an era of collaboration. And Germany offers, as David Baker and I argue, a valuable counterfactual case. Germany is also a contributor to mega science. After the world wars, the lingua franca of science may have shifted from German to English, but Germany successfully rebuilt its science, science infrastructure. Today, the country's university and institute researchers do collaborate across organizational boundaries, but they do so more often internationally. And what we're really looking at in our newer uh, project uh, that I'll talk about is what are the conditions that support collaboration at the organizational level? Let me uh, acknowledge that the work that I've been doing is, is highly collaborative. We have been a, in the SPHERE project, Science Productivity, Higher Education, Research and the Knowledge Society. We were a large team, intercultural team of scientists from China, Germany, Japan, Luxembourg, Qatar, Romania, South Korea, Taiwan, and the US, uh, led by David Baker uh, at Penn State. And I think Jennifer Dussel is all, also here uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, webinar with us today. Uh, we had funding from Qatar National Research Fund, um, and our goal was to conduct an international comparison of the influence of higher education models and higher education expansion, science capacity building, on scientific knowledge production since 1900. But we focused on Europe, North America, and East Asia as the three centers of global science. Uh, we heard about this on Tuesday in the webinar that Simon Margeson and, and Ji Zhu presented uh, on this uh, center periphery model. Um, and we found that these three centers continue to be the main producers of scientific research. This longitudinal analysis uh, looked at different levels. We looked at disciplines, at organizational fields, at the organizational forms, and also at in individual organizations, especially the influential ones. Uh, we measured science production in the science and technology disciplines and health, STEM plus, via the gold standard for measurement, namely peer-reviewed research articles. And I'll talk more about the data in a minute. Our newest project, uh, QNO, Relational Quality, Developing Quality Through Collaboration Networks and Collaboration Portfolios is also uh, the work of a number of universities and scholars uh, in Germany and Luxembourg. I'm working with Jennifer Dusdal, Anna Kosmitsky, Achim Oberg, and others um, with funding from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research with our project base at the Leibniz Center for Science and Society in Hanover to focus on Germany and its dual pillar research system and look actually at all organizations producing science in Germany. We want to investigate how scientific publication patterns have developed, analyzing the proportion and impact of inter-organizational collaboration networks. 
Uh, organizational output depends on the collaboration portfolios among German organizations and their partner organizations worldwide. And we're hoping to use this analysis to uh, answer the question, how is collaboration enhancing scientific quality at organizational level? So briefly on the data and methods, uh, we conducted comparative institutional analyses of higher education and science systems, looking particularly at organizational fields and forms and organizations um, in a number of countries. And the, the Century of Science uh, collects those national studies and also comparative studies for Europe. Uh, and we paired this with bibliometric analyses of peer-reviewed research articles and citations in STEM+. Plus. This is uh, raw data we bought from Thomson Reuters, now Clarivate Analytics, for the entire world from 1900 to 2011. We recoded that at an organizational level. Um, and then we had a, strat a, a um, stratified rep representative sample in five-year steps. And then from 1980 to 2011, we had annual data. In the new CUNO project with our colleagues in Hanover and uh, Mannheim, we are doing quantitative and network analyses uh, up to 2020. And we have now uh, purchased all disciplines for Germany and international partners from Clarivate Analytics. And that, that is being fed into a relational database so we can do some of the network analyses that I will present in a minute. We have article information uh, on title, authors, disciplines, organizational affiliation, journal, journal impact factor, and citations. Of course, we have certain limitations. We focused on certain fields. We have, of course, the English language dominance and Western journals. And our focus here is mainly on counting the articles, um, not on content or citation analysis. But in the Kino project, we are, we are pairing that data with qualitative case studies, where we are doing interviews and site visits to investigate the organizational conditions that facilitate durable collaboration networks. So when we speak of rising scientific production, we can ask the question if we are find pure exponential growth or with saturation. Um, we all know that higher education and science are expanding globally. We have rising numbers of students and scientists, organizations, many more journals being founded. We have institutional factors that determine that scientific growth and particular developmental patterns. Early founders of bibliometrics hypothesized that scientific growth would slow down. As you can see in the graphic from Derek de Solar Price, he expected from his vantage point in the 1960s that we would have exponential growth with saturation, that there would be a level at which uh, the amount of science globally would, would be sufficient. And we asked the question in the Sphere Project, if these early uh, hypotheses were correct? Well, uh, not quite. <laughs> uh, we find actually that global production is an asymptotic exponential curve. We have millions of new SCIE articles per year. We now have more than 200 countries contributing to global science. And we also have, um, via the higher education expansion, the investment in R&D, and uh, global and regional competition. But we also have uh, pure exponential growth in collaboration from the 1990s, uh, extensive networks of collaborating scientists, of, often in the, with the English language um, and with the assistance of ICT and the internet. So it's a story both of competition and collaboration in global science, uh, and really a much more inclusive model of, of participating in uh, higher education and science globally. If we look at the three centers of scientific production that most that have the most production, Europe, North America, and East Asia, um, we can see that there has been more and more countries participating. Um, however, that the proportion of those uh, some regions has gone down. So the European proportion has uh, declined. Uh, and the US proportion has declined simultaneously with a rise in East Asia. And all of the countries relatively stable uh, with a tremendous contribution of a number of smaller higher education and science systems contributing um, relatively marginal proportion to that global science. If we look at the historical development of Germany now, because Germany is really the engine, is one of the engines with the UK and France of uh, European science, 
We have four phases of growth from 1900 to the Germany's nadir in 1945, where we have rather relatively slow growth. Then a consolidation phase as Germany rebuilt after the Second World War up to 1960. And then things really start taking off. We have an expansion of higher education, a little slower massification than in the US, uh, and the start of big science. And then uh, in the mid 90s after unification, uh, we have a, a, the era of collaboration beginning and a number of other um, government initiatives, including the Excellence Initiative that are uh, putting a, a primacy on collaboration. Uh, and we see that Germany has, like the global trends and the regional trends, we see uh, in pure exponential growth in their scientific output in the STEM fields. Uh, thinking about different organizational forms, we, in our coding process, we, we, we wanted to be able to do these analyses where we could, we could finally compare different organizational forms. Uh, and we came up with this uh, coding matrix. I won't spend too much time on it, but it's important to note that um, we have organizational forms have different characters, different tasks and goals related to research, different types of research. Um, and we found that there were five main organizational forms that produce science. We have universities, research institutes, companies, government agencies, and hospitals. Those are the five major types. Then we have academies, associations, infrastructure, laboratories, military, museums, and non-university education, as well as a small uh, category of other. Um, these are often hybrid organizations like the Charité in Berlin that are very interesting. Um, and so that was how we, um, we recoded all of our global data with this uh, matrix. The organizational forms, this is a representation from Jennifer Dussel's book, Welche Organisationsformen produzieren Wissenschaft? Um, and she shows here in the, the how important universities are in German science. You see that on the, the, the box for, for universities. And then all of the other uh, organizational forms, non-universities are in uh, you know, about another third or 40%. Um, and here we can see major differences in the organizational form uh, and their scientific productivity. So let me speak a little bit about Germany's second pillar. Uh, its universities are well known, but um, often un, not as quite as well understood are the importance of four major associations of research institutes, the Max Planck Society, the Fraunhofer Society, the Leibniz Association, and the Helmholtz Association. These are very large uh, collections of research institutes uh, founded at different times. The Max Planck Society actually goes back to the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, um, in, uh, that was founded after the uh, First World War. They all have uh, many thousands of employees in a number of research institutes. The Max Planck Society focuses mainly on basic research, uh, Fraunhofer on applied research and transfer to companies. Leibniz uh, is a mixture of uh, institutes that focus on social and natural sciences and humanities. Uh, and the Helmholtz Association is large, large infrastructure, big, big science projects. If we think about the uh, uh, personnel, we have a, a much more employees in universities, obviously, uh, about 660,000 and 100,000 100, employees in extra university research institutes. One of the major constraints for our analyses in science production and thinking about science productivity of different organizational forms was the lack of data in Germany on uh, this level at the organizational level. Um, it's been very difficult to reconstruct exactly how many uh, employees work in these different research institutes. That data is often not available. Um, we've tried the best we can to standardize. Um, but this has also been one reason why we decided to, to now move to network analyses where we actually are looking also uh, in our case studies at the organizational level. So we have a better sense of uh, the, the personnel in those different institutes in different diff disciplines. So if we think about uh, science production of Germany within the very rich European context, um, we can see also these phases of small, big to mega science from 1900 to 2010. And we see the two pillars of German science, the universities on the one hand and the research institutes on the other. Um, from 1950, we had a, a, about six times as many universities now, and then 60 times as many research institutes. 
the number of publications um, um, goes up, uh, of course, very strongly, but the proportion within Europe uh, uh, declines in the, from the, the era, era of small science to big science to mega science. Uh, then it goes up again uh, slightly in, in the era of big science with the founding of an, an several dozen new universities and many hundreds of research uh, institutes. So we also, of course, are most interested in looking at the international co-authorships and seeing how well Germany's universities are connected globally. Publications of researchers at universities and research institutes uh, are presented here. So the, the dark gray is the proportion of universities that uh, publications and the light gray is the research institutes. So you see that both are uh, increasing very strongly. The university proportion um, is relatively continuous. It goes declines somewhat with the founding of the many hundreds of new research institutes to 70%, uh, which I think is a, is a very important finding. Uh, we see growth despite stagnant funding. Uh, Germany's higher education sector has absorbed a tremendous growth in the number of students, especially over the last 10 years, uh, without much increase in funding. So uh, that's uh, really an, uh, also important to think about the, the uh, preferential treatment that the research institutes have enjoyed over the last decades. Mode one remains the dominant form of science production in Germany. If we put that into uh, contrast in terms of the disciplines and the contribution, the relative contributions of German universities and institutes to science, technology, agriculture, health, and other, in 1980 and 2010, this is from a publication last year in Minerva, we um, show that we actually have stable proportions despite this redistribution of resources. So rising funds for research institutes and stagnation for universities. Um, we have a quadrupling um, of cross-sectoral co-authorships between research university-based scientists and research institute-based scientists, but it's a relatively, still a rel relatively mar uh, modest proportion overall we find of 12%. And there the, also the disciplinary distribution is relatively stable. So let me turn now to uh, some of the network analysis that we've been, we've started to do. Um, this is particularly uh, the work of Achim Oberg at the University of Mannheim and, and Hamburg University. Um, he has uh, been working with us uh, to establish a relational database and uh, together we are, we are able to go beyond the analysis we did in the SPHERE project um, to really look at, at this uh, organizational level um, at which kinds of organizations are collaborating, which organizational forms are collaborating. We see in this overall picture of the scientific networks a clear-cut stratification of core and periphery in German science. Uh, we also see we have a mix of universities, technical universities, and extra university research institutes in the core. Um, and in the periphery, we find universities of applied sciences, hospitals, government agencies, and companies. So even though those are some of the major science producing organizational forms, they are uh, still in the periphery. And it is our research universities and institutes that are, make up the core of German science. Looking now, this is just presenting the, uh, the relationships, uh, the co-authorship relationships of different organizations. Uh, you can see the, the, the overall picture. Uh, the thickness of the relationship, and that represents the number of papers with co-authors between the two organizations. Sorry. And the size of the node, of course, is the number of collaborative relationships or co-authored papers. Uh, in aggregate. Then it's, uh, we wanted to, we are actually in the process of looking at all the different organizational forms and how they, how their collaboration is evolving. You can see the universities have a very strong, uh, uh, are very strong in the core. They remain the central organizational form for German science. The research institutes are also very strong, but are more uh, uh, scattered. Um, and then the universities and research institutes together uh, make up 
the core of German science. And we find that research institutes often act as catalysts for universities and technical universities. So this is something that um, these visualizations are the first we have to show. Uh, and in the, in, in, the, in the second half of our project, we're gonna be looking much more closely um, at these different relationships um, of the different organizational forms uh, and different organizations in Germany. I wanna also stress the, the uh, important difference in terms of disciplinary re relevance of organizational forms. Here, just a portrayal of biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, in biology, we can see that the old universities are quite significant. There are some extra university institutes that are important uh, and companies are partly connected um, in that network. Uh, in terms of chemistry though, we have universities and technical universities being very significant. We have a variety of extra university institutes um, and companies are central actors in chemistry. As we're of course seeing in the search for vaccines, how important uh, companies are to, to that. Um, in physics, we have technical universities being very important uh, in, this, in, in this field in Germany. Extra university institutes are a central resource and companies are largely irrelevant. So this is, this is evidence that we need to look much more closely at the relevance of organizational forms and types of relationships varying by discipline. Let me uh, conclude now with a few points also for our discussion. Um, we can, we can see that we have a remarkable, pure exponential growth of science that is continuing due to expanded higher education and research capacity. We have an inclusive globalization of science since 1900. So everyone is participating in, the, in this uh, science production uh, to varying degrees. We find that Europe, North America, and East Asia uh, remain dominant. We have rising global, regional, and national competition, but also massively increasing collaboration worldwide across Europe and in Germany. Uh, the majority of the world's STEM plus publications and other fields as well are co-authored now. That is a huge shift in our way of operating, and some of our uh, much of our research has not uh, has not yet begun to to deal with that. And that's one of our hopes for our projects is to really get at some of these issues of collaboration. We have shifting modes of science production from small science to big science to what we call mega science. We've seen that Germany has two pillars of science production, a long-term institutionalization of research universities and research institutes. Both organizational forms contribute to science production, yet we have different foci, different network structures, and different types of collaborations. Uh, in terms of disciplines, organizational forms, and also foci of uh, basic or applied research. Universities remain the driving force of science. They're the key, key platform for collaboration in Germany as they are globally. And among organizational forms, collaboration varies with intensity and has diverse characteristics. And we um, are very uh, hopeful that we, many of you in the, in the audience will uh, can, will join us on the quest to understand better these kinds of collaboration networks. Um, and so thank you very much. And thank you, Justin. I mean, that really gave us a great deal of insight into the German system and uh, provokes many questions, I think, um, and questions too about your ongoing collaborative work uh, and the larger project. Um, let me ask a couple, uh, invite our our uh, participant audience to come in as well with your Q and A contributions. Justin, um, the formation of a separate set of institutes, uh, I, I didn't realize it was as late as it was in German modern history. Um, you will have thought a lot about this question, I'm sure. Uh, was Germany right to establish the separate institutes? Uh, what was the original uh, motive or, or reason for doing so? Is that reason still relevant? Uh, is it working well uh, as, a, as, a, as a distributed system between different kinds of form of research uh, organization? What about the relationship between the institutes and the universities? Are there barriers or, does, or do you have a useful division of labor, complementarity and so on? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, so it, indeed the development of research institutes began very early and actually was a response to 
um, the uh, first nadir of the 20th century in Germany, the, the, the uh, defeat in the, in the First World War. So this was an attempt to, um, to really bolster German science. Um, and um, I think policymakers were believing that they could have more influence on research institutes than they could on autonomous universities. Um, the model that they chose, and, and David Baker and I are, have been thinking a lot about what we can learn from this contract, uh, counterfactual case because Germany maintains, uh, invests both in research universities and in research institutes. Um, they followed the genius model, the Harnack principle, um, where they thought they could identify uh, the most important researchers of every generation. And we believe that um, this model has has led to some very successful science and uh, some very uh, uh, reputable and, and um, uh, very prestigious um, institutes and also very important scientific discoveries. However, when we look at the, the funding distribution in Germany today, uh, as I mentioned, the universities have re experienced rel relatively stagnant uh, research, fu uh, research funding and infrastructure. Um, and we think that there could be more, that Germany could actually achieve more if it were to balance, to, have, to rebalance the investment in R&D and, and provide more to uh, the universities. I think we have seen in our, in our uh, analyses that a lot of the research institutes are um, publishing in very high impact journals and are able to uh, make very important contributions uh, to science but the overall platform for and the infrastructure that science needs um, is really provided by the universities. And that's really um, uh, important for us to think about when we're uh, looking at the dual pillar research policy in Germany. One more from me too, um, Justin, this is a larger question perhaps. You talked about the exponential increase in science and using number of papers as a measure um, and of course we, we are constrained by what we can what we can measure mm -hmm. uh you know there's a pushback against that argument which says that well yes yeah great expansion in, in the volume of work but but our fundamental discovery is advancing in the same rate not that that's terribly easy to measure is it and uh in, and perhaps we're seeing more and more noise and less and less substance and so on um I mean, how do you how do you see that problem? I mean, how do we do you think that um, the quantity measure is, is is adequate? I mean, what else can we use to measure progress in science? Because I mean, the number of papers is only a proxy, isn't it, for knowledge itself? And knowledge itself is the is what we're really interested in, and that's harder to get at. Yes. Well, I think uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question, and of course, it, it's a perennial one. Um, if we knew where discoveries would reliably come from, we wouldn't need as many papers. <laughs> but I, I have to say, we haven't been very good at predicting uh, which papers are gonna be the most important. So I have to say, uh, I would say that, that uh, I think quantity in, 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 the, in a sense uh, is, is better, the, is better than, than less quantity. Mm -hmm. I'll take it if we can, if we can achieve it. Um, and of course, it raises the very question that we are trying to address in the CUNO project, which is to find out, um, you know, what is relational quality? If we're all collaborating, does this make better science? Mm -hmm. I can say for me, for myself, having collaborated with 50 people over my career, um, that I have learned so much more from uh, collaborative work than, uh, than um, single, single authored, authored work although that has, of course, an important uh, uh, place too. Um, but we're really trying to get at this question of what are the conditions for the best science? And we think that collaboration is, is the key to that. Mm. Thanks, Justin. Let me bring in Maya chang -Siliani. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Justin. Fascinating talk. Really nice to hear about your work in greater detail. Um, so this is a very important question for Germany, as well as a number of other countries, as we have discussed uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, one of my collaborators, Andre, is in the audience now. We are doing a similar type of work on mm -hmm. former Soviet countries because 
they learned from Germany. <laughs> they took the example of Germany to establish research institutes. And this uh, organizational form is very much alive and well in a number of former yeah. Soviet countries. So this is a very important um, mm -hmm kind of um, uh, evidence that you presented for my own work too. So I wonder what you could tell us about the future. <laughs> Do you think things will change? Because um, I think Philip Altbach asked a very important question as well, like what is the most efficient way? So I think in your presentation, you tried to <laughs> kind of avoid saying what is most efficient. I know your views and I perhaps it will be interesting to tell everyone what do you think is the most efficient way and how do you think things will change in the future? For example, in the next 10 or 20 years, do you think the proportions will be different in terms of uh, which, or which sector produces how much um, research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Excellent question. I, I think um, really if, if we're thinking of the system uh, in general, uh, we have to say, I would, I would say that the university is really the core organizational form. That's what you need. It's the platform that all, it's the organizational form that all other organizational forms rely on, not only for intergenerational transfer of knowledge and the training of, of, of younger uh, scholars and scientists, uh, but really, we see this in our in our analyses I couldn't present today, um, and, and we are of course um, really looking exactly at, at that issue of of what is what does it mean to have these different organizational forms all participating in the scientific endeavor? Um, I think that diversity is a huge strength, but we we do not have research policy. Certainly not in Germany do, do we have research policy. That is that is evidence based. That is based on real knowledge about um, the amount of investment that goes into these different organizational forms. Um, I don't think you can you can imagine, or I can, I certainly cannot imagine, a a a leading science system that does not have strong universities at the core. Um, so that's perhaps an answer. Um, will things change? Yes, I think um, of course we're seeing that. Um, technology has had a huge impact, and of course, we're in the middle of learning about it in this webinar series, which has been incredibly uh, insightful and, and a huge source uh, over the last year of great ideas for, for me and our, and our team. Um, we'll be more connected. We'll, we're more, ever more connected, and so maybe the maybe the the particular organization in which you work is is will become less important. Um, but we'll have to see how the how those also those collab different different networks um, uh, provide uh, opportunities for scientific discovery, and we're just beginning that. So we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Hongwei, Hongwei Gu. Um, hello, Justin. Hi. I would like to ask, um, what did the Dow Pillar research policy mean for science production during the re-establishment of Germany's scientific pre 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 preeminence? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the dual pillar uh, model gate and the, and the policy did give policymakers um, the uh, possibility to, to steer science by founding particular kinds of research organizations and um, these, these associations that I presented, the four associations have, uh, of course, different profiles and, and emphasize different kinds of science, um, especially in applied science. Um, there, there are those collaborations with companies uh, was one way of the, the state also um, uh, supporting particular industries, particular uh, companies. Um, so that was definitely a part of this dual pillar policy um, that was trying to rebuild Germany after, well, actually several times. Uh, and then of course, after reunification again, there was a massive shift in investment strategies in trying to use infrastructure that, that uh, was already existing um, in the GDR, in the former, uh, in, the, in the new, uh, in Eastern Germany. So over the, over the century of science, 
we had no, numerous times where Germany was rebuilding from scratch. Um, and uh, I think that's one reason why we found this dual pillar model because it was it provided um, policymakers with more tools to influence science and to to inject um, investment into into science production. Thank you both. Uh, can we bring in David Mills? Hi, Justin. Thank you. Thank Hi. you very much. Really, really interesting talk. Um, I, I, I'd like to reflect a bit on the exponential growth aspect of your um, talk. I think that's, you know, um, it, it was great to get back to Solar Price and his predictions. Yeah. And, and then the question comes one of sort of when does that stop? Where does it stop? And also, is there an artifactuality to that? driven by a, a citation culture that, that rewards multi-authored papers, that's, that's, that, that, that creates a sort of sense of more science than there actually is. And um, I wonder what your reflections on that were in terms of you know, using that as a proxy for, for measuring science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, of course, that's, that's something that we're, we're all experiencing, the, this pressure to, to publish. Um, but as I said er, earlier, the, um, the collaboration possibilities and the and the the that I think is so valuable mm. uh, so even if um, Vincent Valivier La La has, has done analyses of this and says that the actual output in 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 total has not really increased per mm. scientist mm. but it's a very different kind of working mm. um, and especially as a comparativist um, it's really essential to, to collaborate there's simply no way that anyone can have the the cultural and linguistic expertise to 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 grasp uh, these global trends and patterns. So um, I think uh, yes, there is a sense in which every every uh, especially when we get into mega authorship of you know hundreds and thousands of, of co-authors, um, it's it's very very difficult to then to then to then ascribe um, uh, you know to evaluate that and say what is what is the individual's contribution. However, it does symbolize a very a complete transformation of the way we're working, and I think that that's where I would see it being 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 valuable. Um, the exponential growth uh, curves, I mean, I don't expect them to slow down, um, and um, I think it's as someone who loves science, I think it's good if people if more people are joining the joining the this activity. So, great. Okay, thank you. That's great. I have the same prejudice too, Justin. I'm, I'm, I really welcome it too. But then, as a journal editor, I, you start to get a 15% increase a year in the number of papers becomes uh, a little difficult to manage. You just keep multiplying the number of editors. You have more layers of editors. You 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 you, you massify everything, and uh, you sort of worry about the precision and quality of the decision making that uh, that results. Um, can we bring in Phil Oldback, followed by Victoria Triff? Phil. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted, uh, uh, you answered my earlier question uh, before, thank you, uh, sort of answered it. Um, uh, could you reflect maybe if you know anything uh, about the situation in uh, Russia, which, which uh, sort of followed the German pattern when it organized its scientific uh, arrangements a long time ago, uh, and now Many people say that the Russian Academy of Sciences doesn't do so well. Um, and, uh, you know, the relationships between the universities and the RIS are sometimes fraught, uh, sometimes collaborative. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, it's the other big country that has the German model most dramatically and its impact uh, in other parts of the world that were influenced by the Soviet Union, uh, Vietnam and, and uh, China to some extent, uh, uh, is significant and nobody seems to focus much on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I'd actually like to give this, this question on to Maya uh, chang and her colleagues because I think she's working exactly on this, but I, I will say that um, both the Academy of Science model in Eastern Germany in Russia and in China um, was, was a policymaker's fantasy. Um, but I think what we also learned from the United States uh, case is that actually um, science policymakers are very, very bad at, pr at predicting the future, predicting what, what, where the innovation is gonna come from. 
Um, and so uh, I, I would say those kinds of models um, are, are probably not gonna be um, successful in the future as science becomes much quicker and, and much more complex. And, and as, we've, as we've been discussing, uh, more and more collaborative. Um, we, have we find in our, in our first case studies in the Kino project that we really have to be attuned to bottom up processes of, uh, of, of, of collaboration. Um, it's not something you cannot, you cannot force people to collaborate. So you really have to be attuned to, to uh, also the social relationships um, and, and the, the other very diverse sets of incentives and, and of supports for, for um, uh, conducting research. And, and I think that's been very difficult in also in, in bibliometrics to, to really get at that issue. Um, so I think that um, that's why we hope that we will be able to say more about these different organizational forms and how they're, how they, what their roles are within a very complex higher education and science system um, and see which kinds of collaborations are the most productive or the most um, generative of scientific discovery. It's really striking how strong that desire to collaborate is, isn't it? And uh, and you know the intrinsic aspects of it, even apart aside from the extrinsic drivers that we can identify that, and the fact that people are very often very keen to collaborate across di distance and mm -hmm. in relation to difference. You know, there's a real kind of I think appreciation of yeah. the yeah. of the potential learning benefits from from collaboration, mm -hmm. where people have different complementarity, and so on. Maya, Maya Chancelliani, would you like to come in and comment on Phil's question? Um, thank you, Simon. Phil, that's a very important question indeed. So as we see now, we have started working on this topic to see the sectoral differences in the production of research using bibliometric data. Um, Andres here as well, if you wanted to add anything. So we see that some of these countries uh, abolish their academies of sciences that um, uh, were kind of umbrella organization that uh, that brought together all the research institute key research institutes within those countries abolish them at the in the early 1990s that was Estonia Latvia Lithuania two other countries Kazakhstan and Georgia uh, dissolved those academies and research institutes slightly later on in the 2000s. And all other countries at the moment, including Russia, still have those structures in place. However, since more attention and more funding is going into universities and there are new incentive schemes, new requirements for people in terms of publishing, etc., I think slowly, it is my understanding, these structures will probably die out, i.e. they will be merged slowly probably uh, with the universities, I imagine. But dissolving them, I think, was an immense political decision for those five countries. <laughs> and I think other countries, especially Ukraine and Belarus, where those structures, I think, are more or less the same as they were in the Soviet Union, from what I understand, um, they, I think, just do not dare to dissolve those structures yet. However, with the development of universities, more investment going there, more attention, I think, that will ultimately happen. Thanks, Maya. And Victoria, I'm sorry we've held you up a bit. Please ask your question now. No problem. Thank you, Simon. Congratulations, Justin. Um, the academic framework, uh, in spite of uh, global scientific framework, is very polarized. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is to be done in terms of academic priorities? Thank you. Yes, that's a very important question. It's something that, that um, the, uh, the research team and I have been discussing quite a bit. How do we, how do we, um, you know, science funding is still largely national, and we've been trying to understand a bit more about um, setting research priorities within Europe. Um, and of course, there is a massive support of the European Commission and the European uh, Research Council and, and other organizations to work more collaboratively. And we see over time, the, the, the collaborations are getting larger. Um, and I think that is having an impact on the way uh, academic priorities are, are being set. 
Um, but we still are locked in, in largely national structures. But as I've shown today, we are, we are, we are as researchers going beyond those national boundaries. We are collaborating more and more across uh, spatial distance and um, and I think that it's it's harder and harder to 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 um, accept that that is that is that is a good fit of the the science funding and the the prioritization of particular uh, academic agendas if that goes to your question is that what you meant so I think we need to have much more coordination but also much more understanding of the kinds of collaborations that are occurring across countries, across organizational forms um, that, are, that are now the way we do science, right? We live in an era of collaboration, but our funding models are, are still in the national and the nation state model. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Yes, Alil, indeed. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Alil Cohen, please. Hello, thanks. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Justin. This has been really, really fascinating. Um, one very quick question and then another one. Um, just your point about the concept of mega science. Conceptually, is that referring um, kind of primarily to the kind of surprising exponential growth of science and with, with no end in sight? Or is that also referring to kind of increases in the scales of particular global collaborative projects? Mm -hmm. um, and the other one, I was, I'm kind of interested, what's the role of rankings in the German system. So how motivated are research institutes, universities, and maybe the, you know, Germany more generally by global rankings of universities and, and research, basically? Thank you. Great questions. Thank you, Ilya. Um, so uh, mega science is, was very much, um, we were thinking of how can we, you know, we go beyond big. So <laughs> that it's, it's mega, but it has also to do with, um, in fact, many of the largest collaborative research projects are called mega science projects, uh, including vaccine development for COVID-19. Um, but of course we think of CERN and other, other and LIGO and other major collaborative efforts that go across national boundaries um, that are you know, completely globalized. Um, and that mega science is, is a term that is supposed to also speak to that, to that scale. Um, uh, and in terms of rankings in Germany, because uh, Germany does not have a, a, a very long history of differentiating its universities, um, it had uh, a relatively um, egalitarian model uh, before the excellence initiatives uh, tried to establish more differentiation. And I think this was a, was a great, um, is part of why German higher education and research is so strong because Basically, all of those universities were, were contributing in particular fields to, uh, to global science. And um, uh, so rankings really do not play much of a role. And when you have rankings, they are, it's not, it's not, uh, they're not as powerful as a lot of the, the Anglophone rankings where, where you really uh, you have to care about the, 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 the top 10 or so. In, in, in Germany, that's just not the case. And um, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's a very different landscape of relatively strong and, and more egalitarian universities. And that's part of the, part of the power of German, the German model. Thank you both. Um, C. Sanger, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, on reflection, this may be slightly off topic. Uh, however, uh, given your focus on collaboration, uh, is the unit of analysis here the institution or the research team? So, uh, for example, let's say one or more of the principal investigators move between institutions or between countries. Uh, does this affect your analysis at all? Thank you. That's a great question. We've just um, <laughs> actually, as part of our sphere project, we we decided to do a retrospective autoethnography of our own research team because we were interested in precisely your question, oh, which dear. is we're all mobile, where we had doctoral candidates, none of whom were working in their home country. We had, uh, you know, we had from, from North America to Europe, to the Middle East, to East Asia, collaborators who were experts on their country, but working often in a third country. 
Um, we had Qatar funding the project. Um, so we all had to spend time in Doha uh, doing data analysis and, and, and meeting to just to try to figure out what we, what we had found. Um, and so your question is very right that we also have to look at the level of, of the teams um, and the, how the research is actually being conducted. The highly mobile scientists moving from one organization and one organizational type to another. And that research we think is very important to be done. Um, we are privileging in the, in the QNO project more the organizational field and organizational uh, form and organizational levels, um, but we have tried to understand the, the incredibly diverse motivations for collaboration uh, in this recent piece. And um, we have to admit that collaboration, even though I've presented it today as something that is a win-win situation, collaboration also has tremendous costs. And those are often underappreciated. Um, and uh, so we have to also engage in, and team science has been moving in this direction as looking at, at these kinds of questions. Um, but we really don't, we don't actually know sufficient uh, about, sufficiently uh, what are the conditions for all, especially for incredibly large globe spanning collaborations of hundreds of researchers. Uh, and so that for us is really on the research agenda and we think uh, resources should be put in, into exactly those kinds of projects. Uh, and actually we think uh, autoethnographic work on team science could be integrated in many, many different disciplines. Many different projects should have a work package that is reflecting on the process of collaboration to better understand exactly how in very different disciplines with different kinds of research questions, how can that be optimally uh, uh, approached? Thank you very much. Thank you. Focusing on all these questions around collaboration and what you know, persuades people to work together and their, their intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. We're moving beyond bibliometrics, aren't we, into kind of relational sociology. And, yes. and we can bring in a wider range of instruments from sociology and anthropology to, to, to tackle those questions. So the study of science is really opening up, I think, through all of this. Miguel Lim. Miguel. Hi, Justin. Um, thanks Hi. for the presentation. Hi. Yeah, good to see, well, see you again. Um, yeah. uh, on, just building on that note, um, uh, my question was really about um, the types of careers in those different organizations. I think you're trying to build kind of causal or, I mean, hypothesize about relationships between um, organizational forms and, yes. and collaboration. Yes. So um, speaking of teams and, you know, the different kinds of, of, of people in teams. So, for instance, questions about precarity or tenure yes. or rank, or I think that might have an perhaps an important role in explaining how and when, um, or, or, well, different people at different career stages in, in these organizations collaborate with each other. The other one was just a bit more methodological. Um, regarding the, the bibliometrics, um, could you suggest maybe to, to the team, I mean, are there possibilities of normalizing that? So I know that, um, so for instance, Charites features very largely, and we already know the kind of like features of biomedical sciences and their publication patterns. So obviously that's, um, showing up in the data, but would you consider doing kind of normal uh, normalization analysis and, and would that tell us um, something different? And thanks as well for answering my, my earlier question, which you already did um, in response to Eliel. And yeah, okay. cheers, good to see you. Oh yeah, great. So thank you so much for the question about, about careers because um, this is one of the reasons why in, in global mega science, David Baker and I are so um, such strong proponents of the university because the university is really the organizational form that, that is in the business of transferring knowledge intergenerationally and really trying to um, advance science at that, at, that, at that fundamental level. Um, and the, the uh, research institutes, I have to you know, uh, uh, say I, I did my dissertation also at the Max Planck Institute, so I had, had very good conditions to do my work. I, I, it was a dream <laughs> to be associated with Max Planck's uh, Institute um, and also then at the WZB, it's one of the Leibniz Institute institutes. Um, but of course, those are always very short career, career stages, phases that you're, that you're in a research institute, unless you're the director, of course, and then you have, you have a lot of time. Um, and so that, that, that is, is a, 
one of the things that we we are we are looking at is is how um, different collaboration patterns are possible given the different tenures of the different uh, types of scientists and different career stages in those organizations. And those will require different instruments for supporting collaboration, right? So I think that's a very good question you raise about different careers and also, of course, for evaluation, it makes it very, very difficult because there's so much mobility in the system and we don't actually know if a paper was produced you know, wh where were the conditions right for that collaboration to be so, so productive? Um, and your question about bibliometrics, yes, we, um, we have tried to normalize in terms of uh, scientists, FTE, and in terms of population um, and so on. But as I said, uh, at least for Germany, it's very difficult to find the kind of organization level data on, on scientific personnel and, and to know what they're actually doing um, to really understand uh, in an, sort of an, in, a, in a more causal way um, uh, what the output is of a certain investment. And that's still a very difficult, di difficult question um, to answer. Thank you. And thank you both. I'm Peter Scott. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, uh, that was a really interesting talk, lots of really rich data there. Um, part of my question was asked by David, Mills earlier, and that is what would it look like if you map the exponential growth of science onto simply the increase in the scale of higher education and increase in the size of the workforce? Um, uh, is it therefore that surprising given what's happened in the wider, wider higher education research system? Um, uh, and a sort of footnote to that, and again, which I think David referred to, and that is the driving, the increasing emphasis on performance related forms of promotion and so on, and also greater competition between institutions for reputation and esteem. So competition has driven this scale and competition have driven this as well, um, as well as in a sense, pure scientific uh, curiosity or the intrinsic benefits of collaboration. But asking more specifically about collaboration, um, one thing that hasn't come up so far is, uh, do changing patterns of funding for research have any impact on that? I mean. Uh, if there are more diverse and more various forms of funding, does that itself, in fact, in, not only encourage, but in some cases, of course, mandate collaboration? If you look at European programs, um, uh, collaboration is not discretionary, it's a compulsory element. And I just wonder to what extent the fact that the funding sources of research have changed quite substantially and become more diverse, the collaboration, in a sense, is a natural consequence of that. Thank you. That's a very, very interesting questions. Um, uh, yes, I think I think we may not be that surprised about um, exponential growth in, in because of higher education, the capacity building that we've experienced. What I think is is uh, fascinating is to see that that even the uh, the universities, higher education organizations that are that are not so devoted to research are now producing research. So it's really um, very democratic. And I said that about the inclusivity that there's almost you know, no higher education organization that is not producing some science. And so that is, that is um, also driving this, this growth. Um, yes, competition and collaboration are two sides of the same coin. I would say competition is sometimes, um, sometimes a negative. Um, but I think the response that we have seen um, in that it, it seems to be fostering collaboration um, is a, perhaps a positive one, but of course that, that depends also on, on many other factors. Um, yes, funding patterns have diversified, although I would say perhaps not enough, or at least not uh, reflecting on a research base where we would actually know what kinds of instruments are actually uh, doing the kind of work or providing the kind of spaces and infrastructures that we need uh, to, to foster collaboration. Thanks for the question and the answer, but I say Phil Orbach's got a hand up. Um, Phil, do you want to come in at this point before we close? Uh, yeah, thank you. And, and um, uh, here's a bombshell. Um, from some of the things that uh, you've said and also responses to questions, why not abolish the research institutes 
and just uh, put all the money and the personnel uh, into the university uh, context. I've thought that for a while concerning the RAS in Russia, um, which I think is much more problematical than, uh, you know, than, the, than Germany and a number of other countries. But why not just put it all in universities? Indeed, why not? Why not? <laughs> we, have tried, we have tried for, for nine months to place an article on ex with exactly that suggestion in mainstream German media, it is simply not going. It, it, you can't do it. We had a piece in, in Times Higher Education uh, a few months ago where we, where we laid out the argument for that uh, and no German media will touch it. They don't wanna have the debate. So it's, it's really, it's a holy, the genius model of the Research Institute is, seems to be a holy cow in Germany. And uh, um, so, Thank you for that great last comment, Phil. <laughs> uh, and the same is true in Russia too. Yes, and China, I mean, also quite slow to kind of move away from the, the dual system as well. Um, you know, these once you establish these inf institutional structures, they're yes. fairly well entrenched and self-reproducing. And incredible detailed <laughs> nations, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, we university people would see it that way, wouldn't we? But uh, <laughs> I, I find the argument quite persuasive. Look, I want to um, thank you very much, Justin. I, I mean, you opened up the whole world of German science to us properly. We all knew a little of this, but not much. And you've given us a great deal more. And I want to thank you also for the precision and clarity with which you've handled the questions. I mean, it, that was a very good Q&A session. It, it, it would bear reading it again, I think, or looking at it again on YouTube. And, you know, it was you've, you, you've greatly advanced all of us. I think this is the kind of academic seminar where you know, everyone learns a great deal and, and, and appreciates it. And, um, you know, for that, we, we, we thank you very sincerely. And yeah. do come back again. Thank um, you. And I thank you for, for the, also for the great questions and the, and the wonderful moderation. It's been a real pleasure. If I couldn't be in the Department of Education at Oxford in physically, then at least I could be in, in this setting and have this very rich discussion with all of you. So thank you very much. It is a good place to work. And, uh, and, and one of the best things is, is the traffic, the, the good people who come through. Um, and so we're fortunate. And so it's, I think it's our obligation to bring it to the world as far as we, we can too. Um, our next discussion is with Jerry Postiglione. Some of you will know Jerry uh, from the University of Hong Kong. And we're again back in Hong Kong, but we're also back on the thorny problem of the Sino-US the Sino relationship. And, and you know, this fundamental question about whether we're heading towards a bipolar world or a multipolar world in which tensions between China and, and the US are only part of the problem rather than the whole of the problem. Um, and and, and, it's, and I, it's not clear to me who, and I look at this all the time, it's not clear to me which one of those constructions of the world is, is likely to predominate, but Jerry, an American who's lived and worked in Hong Kong for a very long time, knows China well uh, and, knows, and continues to know the US well, I think is uniquely placed uh, in his sensibilities to and, and his commitment to good relationships between the two countries and the rest of the world as well, is very well placed, I think, to bring us into this, this difficult problem. We look forward to that uh, webinar next Tuesday. And once again, thank Justin very sincerely and wish him well in his work, which is really interesting to all of us. Bye. Thanks.